Good morning, everybody. Um, I am Nick Slavic. This is the Ask a Painter Live show. It's a weekly live Facebook show where I use my almost three decades of experience as a master crafts person, a trades entrepreneur, a business owner to answer any of your questions. Um, today, uh, we're going to continue our Mastering the Basics series uh, on estimating. And on this one, this is such a big topic. I have an entire master's class devoted to this topic that takes normally five hours, six hours in person, going through a whole bunch of in-depth sort of stuff, graphs, um, charts, things like this. Today is going to be a mini master's class and I'm going to leave it wide open for questions. I want it. I'm going to let you guys guide the conversation about estimating today because this is legitimately the biggest topic on the painter internets, which is what do you charge for X? So I'm going to leave it open and you guys can basically guide this conversation. I have my presentation. I'm going to lay down some data and some feelings with you as I normally do. And then we're going to get after it. So good morning, everybody. Holy cow. Love to see everybody watching here. Okay. Let's do a, I'm going to screen share in a bit here. Uh, first, I'm going to go through some house cleaning stuff. So overwhelming response to the Ask a Painter Live uh, winter retreat. This is something that we started last year where we get uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 of the most interesting thinkers in the industry together. And some really cool stuff happens when you get into the woods in Minnesota and you start ideating and conversating and things like that. So um, I believe we have one or two slots open. If you're interested in coming, we're, we're finalizing. In a year of COVID, we always have to have a little bit of flexibility in who's coming and who's not. But if you're interested, uh, DM me or email me, nick at nickslavic.com. I can send you more information. But we're right at about capacity, maybe one or two open slots, maybe one or two uh, contingency slots in there. Uh, that'll be happening mid-February, and uh, <coughs> it's, a pretty, it's a pretty awesome thing. You're going to like the people who are there. We have a luxury log estate uh, that has uh, a complex of three buildings. It's on a lake that does not have a public access, which is pretty cool. Uh, there will be snowmobiles. There will be ice fishing. There will be spearing. Uh, there will be a private chef. There will be all sorts of dinners and drinks and appetizers and things like this, uh, some crazy content and a whole bunch of conversation and ideating. So it is going to be good. Also, if you can't make it to the Ask a Painter Live Winter Retreat, um, we can do master's classes in your area. So you can either email me, you can email the PCA and ask for Marsha, or uh, there's a link in this here. If, if you want an all-day master's class where I go deep into a couple topics, um, into I got a menu of about 10 or 12 different things here, uh, all the way from coding science, marketing, estimating, modern apprenticeship, which is hire as many awesome people as you need for your business, uh, marketing, sales, production, hiring a leadership team, uh, coaching a leadership, leadership team and all that stuff. Um, it's going to be pretty awesome. So if you want that stuff in your area, we can work with to find an underwriter and all that other stuff for you. Also, if that wasn't enough, the PCA Expo is back after a two year hiatus because of COVID. We're going to be in Orlando. It's going to be about a three or four day event where uh, some of the biggest thinkers from across the country gather. And it's basically going to be, um, you know, about four days of uh, maybe three to 500 people, business uh, sizes all over the place. It is going to be absolutely awesome. Michael Crane, thank you for the compliment uh, on TikTok. Uh, the he, he appreciated the job costing master's class. So yeah, that has been my my most popular, uh, the, uh, the Mastering the Basics course here. So we're going to continue with this. Again, uh, I'm going to start painting stuff pretty soon on Ask a Painter because I got an itch to get out there and start painting stuff. And people really love to see that. It's been a while since I've done uh, a standard operating procedure or a little mini master's class on painting. So that is coming, folks. But January, February is the time where people start getting introspective. They start thinking about their business. And this is the time where I really want to get out this information, job costing, estimating, uh, standards and deliverables, all this sort of like, you know, all that sort of stuff that you can actually work on your business now when it's not as crazy as August, July, uh, June, things like that. So, all right. If you want to go to the expo, uh, that huge gathering of people, there's a link in the show notes here as well. It is an awesome time, people. I will tell you this. There is a new age of contracting out there, and uh, it is one where we are open we enjoy togetherness, we collaborate, and we will legitimately change the uh, standards of the industry by doing that. I truly, truly believe that. So uh, we're going to go for um, a little bit of question and answer after a while. Like I said, this is going to be a super mini master's class on estimating crash course thoughts, ideas. Um, I did a stunt show a bunch of weeks ago where I just priced all your work. 
Um, that was a interesting thing because people love to bash other painters on the internet. A painter will come on and say, hey, I have this. How, how do you price this? And everybody will say, you're a hack. You don't understand. You shouldn't even be a painter if you don't know how to price it. I will personally challenge every single person watching this show. This show dog whistles to a certain um, part of our industry. We are the good ones, okay? Be inclusive, not exclusive. When you see somebody out there wanting to know a price for something, help them work through the problem. Giving somebody a price will not help them. You need to teach them where the price comes from or help them figure it out along the way. So I'm going to present to you six or seven different methods of coming up with price. I would challenge every single person watching this. When you see the next person post a question about how do you price this, help them. Help them. Do not sit there and say, you shouldn't be a painter if you don't know how to price. Because I can guarantee you right now, every single person watching, including myself, there is something that we're going to encounter in the very near future that we don't know how to price. And then we're, not as, then we're just as good as those other people. You know, We don't have all the answers. But what I'm going to show you today is the theory of how to come up with price. So you can basically say, okay, I've never painted a water tower before. Let's go through one of seven options, and I bet you we can come up with a pretty good price. It's a pretty good thing. So we're going to start here. I'm going to screen share. Yeah, there we go. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll go through a couple slides, and then we'll get through. Um, and then we'll get through. Uh, some questions and answers because we're going live on TikTok, Instagram, and on Facebook. So, all right, folks, here we go. This is another series in the in, in the series of shows, Mastering the Basics. This one is going to be estimating. So, assumptions and variables. For anybody who's ever been to one of my big master's classes, you understand that I like to go through some assumptions first. I would never, ever, ever look a master crafts person or a longtime business owner in the eye and say, this is perfect. This is the only way to do it. If you're not doing this, you're wrong. This is my way, folks. And this is this way has been gathered from hundreds of painters around the country. This is a adaptable system, just like my estimate templates, just like um, my theory of leadership, just like our standard operating procedures for painting. These are not perfect because they cannot address every variable. So what they do is they're an adaptable thing. They're a Swiss army knife. They're a Leatherman's tool where when you approach a job, you can adapt that tool to whatever that job needs. Number one, I can guarantee you this. If you start messing with price and you do not have a proven product yet, you are going to cause mass chaos in your business. What is a proven product? To me, on the steps to becoming a professional company, not just painting company, you have to have a proven product. You have to know what paint goes on what thing, applied by what tool, in what order to get a guaranteed result every time. If you cannot guarantee a result every time, you do not have a proven product. A proven product is backed up by an SOP, a standard operating procedure, a written SOP. If it isn't, excuse me, if it isn't written down, it doesn't exist. Once you have a proven product, once you're consistent, once you know how to enamel a set of kitchen cabinets and get a consistent result every time, then you can mess with pricing. But in any good scientific experiment, if you mess with more than one variable and, and you get a different piece of data back, you're not going to know which variable actually changed the data. That is a horrible experiment. You don't have any act actionable sort of items. So here's the deal. You must have a proven product. Price is only one variable. If you think you're going to mess with price, and take yourself from being horribly unprofitable to profitable, you are likely wrong. You are likely wrong. I will tell you this. Price is only one variable in this whole thing. If you, right now, this year, in 2022, if you want a simple goal, it would be to increase production, increase quality of production, and that alone will drive more profitability than messing with your prices. I would always urge you to up your prices, most likely. Statistically, painters should do that. But it's not materials that is holding you back from profitability. And honestly, for a lot of people, yes, painters horribly underprice their work. But that's not usually what's holding them back. They're not perfect executors of the craft that just aren't pricing it right. A lot of the times, they're not consistent, they're not good at their jobs, and they need to get better at their jobs. You must be consistent in order to mess with your pricing. If you do cabinet jobs, and some takes you three weeks and some, some take you one weeks on all jobs the same, uh, the same size, you should not be messing with price because you need to get your systems down first. You, happen to be you have to be open to the idea that you might not be a good salesperson. You might have a proven product. You might be really good at it. You might be priced right. You may just 
not do well in somebody's house and not gain their trust and not get the job. That's an, that's an option too, right? That's an option. I will tell you this, job costing solves all, right? If you're in doubt, whether your pricing is right or wrong, get the job, get the data point, do the job costing, and then figure out if your pricing is right. You will not know if your pricing is right if you don't get a job. Also, you have to be very careful. Just because a client says yes doesn't mean that job is priced correctly. You have no idea what's going on. It's uh, our, our clients are irrational consumers, just like we're irrational consumers of some other things. Our clients don't know what things should be charged for and they uh, or what, what things should cost. And, um, you know, we have a pretty good idea of what we need to do, but they may have a, a set piece in their mind about what a set of kitchen cabinets should cost. And it might be wildly different from what the industry norm is. So if you run into that and somebody says, oh my God, you're so expensive. Um, if you have the data to back up that you are not expensive, you'll say, thank you for the opportunity. If you don't have the data to back that up, you're going to be like, oh my God, I'm going to go home and change all my pricing. I'm a crook. I'm overcharging. I'm going to lose my business. So you got to have the data. You must job cost. Honestly, when I look around in our industry, when you get on the painter internets, which I call all the Facebook groups where people ask, what do you charge for X? Almost all other painters push back and say, if you don't know your hack, I will say this. I dare you to help them with a the price because honestly, you don't know the price either. You don't know your own pricing. You don't have a data-driven system um, to create estimates, to charge, and then to job cost. Most people estimate by feelings. That's true. And I would call the bluff on every single one of these people and say, okay, you're a genius. Show us what you would do. What's it going to hurt? Show us your estimate for this job that somebody posted on the internet. Say, what do you charge for X? The vast majority of people who comment on those things do not know what to charge themselves. And I wish they would be honest. I wish they would be open and inclusive. I wish they would help each other because our industry would, um, would improve overnight, honestly, if we collaborated more on that sort of thing. Um, you must add the data so you don't go crazy. Um, everything in life is a series of data plus feelings, right? And if you only estimate on feelings and you don't have any standards in your company, everything is going to be based on feelings and you're going to have these wild feeling swings like this. But if you have the data, you're going to be just fine. A great example of estimating was last year was the first full year for estimator Andy, the, the known and love estimator Andy, uh, in the industry now. Um, he was... So we try to sell half the jobs that we estimate, right? So if you do 100 estimates, we like to close 50 of them. Andy was only uh, closing about 35 to 40% of them, and he was beating himself up about it. But we had this beautiful piece of data, which I will show you later. And his actual, there's another statistic in our industry called AJS, average job size. Andy's average job size was twice what mine was. So when I when we were looking at the data, Andy was really beating himself up. We gave him a goal of 50% success ratio, which is selling 50% of the jobs. He was only doing 35 to 40% uh, partway through the year. But when we looked at the data, his average job size was double that of mine. So in, in essence, his success ratio was lower, but his average job size doubled mine. He was doing way better than I was in this role. So in effect he was bumming himself out about actually doing better than me. So data will give you that. If you didn't have that piece of data, you would beat yourself up. You would beat yourself up. So, all right. And I will tell you guys this, uh, I hate to preach the job costing thing, but if you ever want to know what to charge for X job costing, will absolutely tell you that job costing will absolutely tell you that job costing will actually solve almost every piece of friction or problem we think is a problem in our industry. How do you schedule? How do you estimate? How do you hire people? How do you promote people? What are the standards of the company? What, what should you be making in profit? What's your overhead? All these things can be answered by job costing. Okay. Uh, before we get into this one, let me just make sure, let's see if we got any burning questions here. Oh, John Buse. Oh, man, look at all these people. And God dang, you guys are great. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, da, 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 Ron Gerhardt's. What is your method for pricing residential new construction? <laughs> I'll get into that in a little bit. Ron, remind me later on. We'll, we'll hit that one again here. All right. So I just want to make sure there's nothing crazy here that I'm missing. Okay. Like I said, I'm going to go through a few slides here, and then I'm going to let you guys guide the rest of the conversation. You can 
estimating is such a big deal and there's so much theory and data and feelings around it. I'm going to let you guys guide the conversation. So I have something I call the price matrix or the price Bible in my company. Why don't I just hand that over to you? Number one, this thing changes weekly, right? This thing changes weekly. It's a point in time. It's made for me, for my stage of business, for my number of employees. And again, we're going in Minnesota winter. We completely change the way we estimate, the way we sell, the way we market in Minnesota winter. My goals are my goals. Uh, uh, I change the prices on my estimates based on how my goals change, uh, the one, three, five, and 10-year goals. What are my ideal projects? It might not be yours. We do massive historic restorations on Victorian mansions. Many people in our industry just do cabinets. We are going to have vastly different sort of priorities with prices. Um, my method of estimating, which is simplicity. I do not let perfection stand in the way of really dang good. And uh, some people are data-driven engineer types, uh, analytical types that love to have 600 line spreadsheets measure everything in order to get a price. And that makes them comfortable. That does not make me comfortable. I like simplicity. I like getting something out there quick accurate and addressing the client's needs and not worrying about the ins and outs of the project. I'm managing an estimating team. So we actually have a second estimator starting Monday. So when we go out there, we have a sales team technically of three. I'm the marketing manager and the sales team uh, manager for now. Andy actually is promoted to uh, estimator. Andy is now the uh, estimating and sales manager starting Monday. And we will have another estimator, Ian, uh, starting Monday. Uh, and it's going to be awesome. Now, with a sales team of three, we're going to do things quite a bit different than the solopreneur. And I've been there before, so I can tell you the differences. I will tell you this. People always ask how we turn out estimates so quick and how accurate. Now, here's the deal. I've job costed for lots of years. I have a 29-year database, a robust data set, where I can actually turn exteriors of houses. We have done so many of them. I don't even need to measure anymore. We just turn it into a unit price because we know a house like this takes a range of hours between 250 and 350 or 250 to 275 hours. We've always charged this. To be profitable, we need to charge this. It's going to take X amount of gallons. We don't need to measure anymore. We know a house like this is going to do this because it always has done that. So that's where we benefit from. Now, what I can tell you is that you can create this data set in less than a year. If you measure every project, if you job cost every project, you can actually do this. You do not need 29 years. I will tell you this, after a year or two, that's probably all the data you need as far as production rates, measurements, and then you can start building unit pricing like we do. Methods to come up with price. We're going to knock over seven different ways of doing this stuff, and then we're going to go through some heavy question and answers on here. So number one, gut. This is everybody's favorite, right? 99% of our uh, entire industry does this. They do stick a finger in the air. Ah, I feel like this. I have nothing to go on, but it feels like this. Sometimes people say yes. Some people, sometimes people say no. I don't actually know how many people say yes or no, but you know, whatever, I'm busy. You get wild swings uh, without job costing. So if you just estimate on a hunch and uh, change your pricing, you're never going to know if that client was going to take that job anyway. You need to job cost. And sometimes what I've seen painters do is have this punitive relationship with a client based on no data at all, which is, I got burned on the last one, so I'm doubling my prices. Well, you might not have delivered a proven product. You might not have been very good at the job. That client may have overpaid for that last job, but you underperformed. But if you unless you job cost, you're not going to know that. And then you have this sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm not taking this from clients anymore. I'm going to charge double for all this stuff. And then you have this punitive relationship with clients. So again, fine. I have done this before. I'm not, I'm not saying good or bad. Well, yes, I am saying good or bad. This is not a great way to estimate. You can get by. You can cowboy through. I did for lots and lots of years. But I will tell you this. It's not the way we should be doing it. Number two, reasoning. So here's, a, here's something that I like to go through as a thought experiment, which is people say, how, uh, how many linear foot of baseboard can you paint? What do you charge for X? What do you do this? And I'll say, who cares? Let's take 10 steps back and let's just think about what we should make in a year. And then we can start doing some thought experiments and coming back down to that. So think about this. This is data. Most craftspeople that are W-2s get paid on average $25 an hour in the United States. So painters make $25 an hour. Most paint business owners actually only make $22 an hour. Did you guys know the average take home money for a paint business owner in the United States is about $43,000. So that's 21 and a half bucks an hour, $22 an hour, give or take. Most people who are employees as painters in the United States make more than paint business owners because they run their businesses on feelings. They don't job cost. 
Solopreneurs should take home about 50% of the money. So if you get out there and you create $100,000 worth of revenue in a year, you should probably take home about 50% of that. So the thought experiment would be if you want to if you own a business, you need to price and risk. You need to make more than what you would be as a W-2 employee. And I would argue you should make at least double what a W-2 employee does for all the risks that you have. So let's just say this. What if I just want to take home 75K a year as a solopreneur painter? You say, oh my God, how do I even price things? This is so complicated. Here's the simple thought experiment right here. If you want to take home $75,000 a year, and I believe most solopreneurs should, should take home 50% of their money, you basically double that and you say, okay, I'm going to have to generate $150,000. We know some things. There are 261 working days a year. So you take $150,000 of revenue and you say, okay, based on that, I have 261 days to earn that. So you divide $150,000 of revenue divided by 261. Basically, you'll have to create $575 of revenue each day that you work. Now, doesn't seem like a big number, right? I charge $400 to paint the walls in a bedroom. I can do three bedrooms in a high performing day. That's $1,200 of revenue a day. I can double that in a day. So here's where the thought experiment comes in. Are you good enough? Do you have a proven system? Do you have an estimating process? This is not hard, people. You can back into the price of a, of a uh, job based on this. If you want to take home $75,000 a year and you know how many days um, a project is going to take, you can say, okay, I need to make $575 a day, which is actually pretty low. I would argue you should be doubling that as a solopreneur. You can basically say, if this is a three-day project, I'm going to need to get at least $1,725, give or take, uh, in revenue. Of course, I would always say do more than that. But you can start you can start reasoning into projects that way. Industry benchmarks. So these are assumptions. Uh, I, I have on the screen right now a typical breakdown for benchmarks for a 10-person painting company. The magic numbers, the job costing numbers are the variable costs, the materials and the labor. So with material, you want to keep your budgets to about 15% of the revenue for that project or for the company. Labor, you want to keep about 40%, give or take. You can do a pretty cool deduction method of estimating based on materials too, if you, if you only want to keep materials to 15%. So think about Estimator Andy and I had this industrial building uh, to, to estimate, uh, I think it was a year or two ago. And you know what? We've never done um, a building with that particular block configuration. So we don't have a data point. So like I said, we don't have a hundred different versions of this where we've, where we've job costed and figured out exactly what the production rate, the spread rate, how many gallons, how, many, uh, how much revenue per hour. So we said, all right, well, listen, we, let's start with the things we know. We can measure this building. That's not a big deal. And then we can make some assumptions on paint coverage and then back into a cost based on materials. So let's go through this thought experiment together. The assumption is we want to we want to spend no more than 15% material. Um, these are some things as a master craftsperson you can deduce pretty easily, which is the block in this is kind of that in and out block. It's got a whole bunch of deep ridges in it and it's rough and it's and it's going to take a lot of paint. It has been painted before, which helps a lot, but I assumed about 100 square foot uh, coverage per gallon. We pay uh, for this particular product, a masonry product, uh, 4170 per gallon uh, with all our taxes and paint care. And I measured the sides. You can see the southeast, north and west on here. That gives us about 19,350 square feet uh, of actual wall space. I divided that by 100, which is the coverage of the paint. So for one coat, we're going to need 193 and a half gallons, give or take. That's what we assumed. Assumptions, right? You can say, Nick, that's probably not perfect. I'll say, fine. What else are you going to do? This is a great this is a great thought experiment to start backing into prices. So obviously, we don't buy a half gallon. So 194 gallons times the amount of um, uh, price we pay per gallon equals we're going to have over $8,000 in just paint cost for one coat of paint on this building. Now, if you want to figure out it, to, to keep materials to 15%, and that has to be 8,090, you divide 8,090 by 15%. And that'll tell you if you charge $53,933 and you spend $8,090, that would be 15% materials. You would have to charge at least that to keep materials at 15%. So there you go. You have one data point. This may not be perfect, but this is a reasoning way, a thought experiment way to back yourself into a price. Now, let's take it even farther. What about labor then? And how many hours should a project like this take? You can make a lot of assumptions this way. So we got a 19,350 square foot building. You can see the equation here uh, above the arrow. Now, 
we times 40% labor. Because remember, the industry benchmark is 40% labor. So we have about $21,573 in labor cost. And if you divide by revenue per hour, which is another benchmark, we want to create at least $55 of revenue an hour, again, which I would consider low. We would basically have to say our painters, oops, our painters need to get this done in 392 hours and use 193 194 gallons of paint. That's a good place to start. You also do a sniff test at the end of this thing. Is $53,000 an average, a good price for a building like this? It's a lot of money. Sometimes you just have to use your intuition and, and come up with that stuff. But here is one way using knowns. This is just algebra from high school. Solve for X. We know some things. We don't know some things. Let's use the things we know to help us reason into the things we don't know. So instead of a world of, holy crap, I've never seen a building like this. I don't even know where to start. Great. This may not be perfect. You have a place to start based on data, based on simple data. Job costing. This is my favorite one right here. And I love the bedroom experiment based on this sort of thing. Number one, do a project. Job cost it, compare it to the benchmarks, and then you can adjust if needed. But there's a whole bunch of variables. So here's one actual project I did years ago. Bedroom wall repaint, sold it for $425, $60 in material. So that gives us about a 14.1% uh, material um, budget. Labor it took me three hours. And as, as the owner, I got to put something in there. Um, so I put myself down for $30 an hour at times 1.25 burden. We have a 25% burden. So you take three times 30, which would give you $90, $90 in a rate. And you have to add 25% of that for labor burden. Gives you about $112.50. So Benchmark for labor on jobs is 40%. I did that job in 26.4%. This lets you know you have a proven product, your standard operating procedure is good, and you're producing at a very good rate. Another rating of a job is revenue per hour. Not the best, uh, it's a little bit variable, but I produced $121.60 an hour. The industry benchmark, low benchmark, I would say is um, uh, 55. So again, perform very well on that one. And that's what I would expect, a very seasoned master craftsperson working alone to do. Now, assumptions and decisions based on this, right? We got this data point and this doesn't necessarily say good or bad, but you can make decisions based on this. So number one, can you raise your rates? That depends. Uh, number two, did you get a callback on this project? So you may have had, you may have put up a really big number, $121 of revenue production in an hour. Oh my God. But you may have messed up and you had to come back and do more work to correct it. Was this project an anomaly? You have to ask yourself that. What is, was there something special about this project that does not make it good? That does not make it good. Um, when you charge $425, do you sell 50% of your work? So again, when you perform this well, I would consider this a very well-performing project. Can you actually sell them for that price? Now there's two options here. You can say, oh my God, I only sold one of these this year. I performed very well. That's an indication that you charge a very high price for that and it's not something replicable, it might be an anomaly. If you are booked out nine months selling 425 bedrooms and performing like this, even though you're overperforming, you can raise your prices. You should be knocking that lead time down to two to four weeks, give or take, uh, in an ideal world. And is your schedule full? One of the things people say, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that I use to judge whether a price is right is, is your schedule full? Do you have enough jobs to take you somewhere between two and eight weeks out. And I will say, then you probably price correctly. It doesn't really matter what you charge. If you have enough work, you have priced it correctly, give or take. Method number five, unit pricing. So this is one of my favorites. Um, it comes from job costing over a long period of time. The pros, the price comes easy, right? So I can walk into a whole house, popcorn strip, ceiling paint, wall paint, trim enamel, cabinet enamel, all this other kind of stuff. And in about 40 minutes, I can take all my images, get it into an estimate form, walk back into that house with a huge matrix of prices and a one pager for the client. Because I don't have to sit there and measure every piece of baseboard. I don't have to measure every window. We have such a robust data set that we know there's only three or four different kinds of windows. And in the past history, a fixed window with no paintable sash only takes X to X time. It's never taken more, it's never taken less. So in order to be profitable on that, we need to charge X. Same thing with standard passage doors, same thing with one bedroom equivalent of baseboard, 15, 15, 15, 15 foot. You basically have 60 feet of baseboard in an average bedroom. 
And how long has that taken us? It's never taken more than this. It's never taken less than this. So instead of measuring, because we're not surprised by bedrooms, right? Like when have you been surprised by either kitchen cabinets or bedroom? You know, one might be six inches bigger this way, six inches bigger that way, but you're never really surprised. So we don't take the time to measure a lot of that. Because we just know that based on our history, we have to charge X for an, a bedroom equivalent of baseboard because that's what it is. We've done all the measurements before. So now problem with unit pricing is obviously exteriors where they there's tons of variables, especially prep and size and weirdness and uh, a number of colors and things like that. Interiors are actually a heck of a lot easier to do unit pricing, uh, but we'll get into that in a little bit here. Production rates. So this is this is a, a something that people are a little surprised about when they ask me. They say, "Hey Nick, uh, what do you charge for square foot for exterior repaints?" And I'll say, "I have no idea." We did those calculations years ago, and out of those calculations, and this is hilarious, I actually made an equivalent of a children's book on our price guide. Not because estimator Andy and now estimator Ian uh, have the brain of a child, but because I took years and years of data and packed it down into about eight different houses that we do. And there's a range of prices for those houses. So there's a picture of the house. There's a, um, a, the amount of square footage because we've done all these crazy measurements in the past and we have a price range for that. And then we kind of list the variables out about prep and colors and landscaping and things like that. So if I'm being honest, I have done all this stuff. I have done all the homework years and years ago. We have square footage stuff. We have production rates. We have linear uh, square foot rates, things like that. The problem is it becomes less and less useful because it's not me out there doing the painting. It's apprentices and apprentices at all level. We have people who have been here for four years who are masters and produce highly. We have people who have been here for four weeks who don't produce very highly. So the problem is you can chart all those production rates, but pretty soon you need to figure out another form of pricing for this. And to me, production rates mean much less because of the training version of our company. Um, but I will say this, production rates are the easiest to transfer. You can take somebody who knows nothing about painting. And if you give them a formula, you say, we charge, you know, $2 a square foot or $2 a linear foot for baseboard. All they have to do is measure the baseboard and input the number. That's a beautiful system. But the simplicity belies the complexity of if a variable gets thrown in, they can be so wildly off but you must have a large data set for production rates. Now, fatal flaws of estimating by production rates. Again, like I said, whose production rate? I have a image of a beautiful historic home on there. Not many people have a hundred different versions of these that they've done and job costed and been profitable at. So the problem is you're still gonna run into stuff you've never done before and you're not gonna have a production rate for it. And then if you, the only thing you do is rely on production rates, you're not gonna have another option. So you need to have one of these seven options at the ready when you have to do that. And also measuring complex substrates. Uh, I am not a compliance guy. If I had this beautiful historic home on here and I had to measure every square foot of soffit on this house, it would take me a week to get it accurate. And I can guarantee you this, it would not be accurate at the end. So again, for my personality type, this doesn't work very well. I'm not a compliance sort of guy. I'm not an analytical, you know, everything must be, you know, accounted to the penny of everything. Um, and then again, if you don't have these data points, what are you going to do? You have to default to another method. So market rate is another one of my favorite methods here. Now, this is high risk, high reward sort of stuff, which is this can be ethereal. This can be a feelings based thing at some times. Market rate is the highest possible price that the people in your market will pay for a job. When people say, Nick, what are your production rates? What do you charge per square foot? Or what do you charge per hour even? Or what's your charge rate? I'll say, I don't care. I'm going to charge the most I can charge for this job while delivering value to the clients while keeping a full schedule. That is a very hard number to come by because you need tons and tons of data. How do we get this data? The last full year that I did all the estimates for this company, I did over 800 estimates. You can start detecting patterns and success ratios and average job sizes, and you can figure out very quickly what the market rate for that is in your area. SR, success ratio. If you sell 50% of the jobs uh, that you're out there, uh, that you estimate, theoretically, you're sort of priced right. This is not perfect. This is mainly for larger companies. If you're a solopreneur, I would say, you know, you're closing 20 to 30% of their jobs at the most because you don't need that much work. But if you have five to 10 employees and, you're, and your success ratio is 50%, I would say you're priced sort of right. That's a quick sniff test, test, if you will. 
Now, the good thing is uh, with market rate, we analyze every project every week. Uh, all our estimates, all our completed projects. And we have this pulse that comes into the company that we review as a leadership team. So we actually adjust our rates sometimes daily, weekly, and monthly. I truly believe as leaders, we need to detect patterns. And this is one of them. When you get the data back from job costing, you say, oh my God, our popcorn stripping jobs are not profitable at all. So let's look at the hours per job and let's see those production rates. Stripping popcorn per square foot per hour, what are we at? And if you see wild variations, then you need to train your people better. But if they're always stripping 40 square feet per hour, give or take, and you're not profitable, then you might say, well, that might be a good indication that we're below market price and we need to raise our prices a little bit. The biggest thing is with your estimates, you need to start tracking them. And we're going to get into another show about marketing, but you need to track where these things come from. Uh, you need to track how many jobs you estimate, the price of those jobs, how many jobs you sell, and what the value of those jobs are. This is the data you're going to need to actually quell those wild variables. Here's what I see people uh, do a lot. You go on three estimates one evening, and all three clients right in a row say, oh my God, that's so expensive. I would never do that. If you didn't have some data to back that up, I would imagine a scenario, I've been there before, where you're lying in bed saying, oh my God, I've screwed up all my pricing. I've got all these estimates out there. Nobody's going to take me. My business is going to die. It's going to blow away in the wind and I need to lower my prices drastically. The problem is you don't know if those people were ever going to purchase painting services. You don't know that. They may have never been your clients. They may just have been window lookers and it doesn't make them bad, right? But it, it's a bad data point because they are irrational. They may, their alternative might be a quart of chalk paint and their neighbor coming over to help them. They may say, well, you know, that's the other alternative. I was thinking about hiring a professional, but I just want to know what the price is. Don't make wild swings in your prices unless you have the data. What you're seeing on there right now is my sales tracker from last year. Uh, I sold 634K, Andy sold over 2 million. We, we look at it weekly and we take an hour deep dive into these numbers every single week to see where we're at. Um, and this is the sort of data that helps us bolster where our prices are. Because number one, we want to create good value for the client, no matter what. Number two, we want to keep our people busy. Number three, we want to be profitable. And those three things drive all our numbers. So remember, this is something that somebody very much more wise told me years ago about this stuff, which is a third of the people that you go estimate probably will never use you in the first place, right? A third will probably use you unless you throw up on your shoes, which basically they're going to buy from you no matter what. And a third are kind of on that edge where you might be able to sway them with a value proposition. I will say this, is my pricing correct? Are you busy? Do you have enough money? Uh, do you have enough jobs coming in to keep your company afloat? That is the quick sniff test of saying, okay, at least some things are going right with your estimating, but now you have to job cost and refine that. You may never feel like you solve this. You may never feel like you solve this. Imagine, uh, I was big on virtual estimating three or four years ago. We did half of our jobs in one year uh, virtually. Um, the pandemic hit and I thought, oh my God, my time has come. I have a beautiful virtual estimating system down. In a time of COVID, people really demanded human contact, for better or for worse. Nobody wanted virtual estimates. We couldn't give away a virtual color consult for free that year. We didn't give away one. Nobody wanted it. So you have to constantly be on the lookout for these things. You have to constantly be able to adapt to the market. 90% of painters should raise their prices. Um, during that year of pandemic, we had master's classes right here where master crafts people and solopreneurs from all over the country came in and we job costed projects together and universally everybody undercharged and did not make as much money as they thought they were. Data point for you. Price modifiers. Um, you have to consider that when I quote people on prices. And when I help painters with prices, this is what I charge because are you growing or are you stability? We are in an, a, an aggressive growth mode. So my prices are going to be lower because I have to feed this machine with jobs, easier jobs, so that my apprentices can learn, so that we can stay, so that we can be profitable, so that we can take care of our clients. Lead time. Do you need work? Or are you booked out four months? If you're booked out a year to a year and a half, you theoretically, by the laws of economics, have grossly undersold your work possibly even giving it away, give or take. If you have a less than a one week lead time, you are either overpriced or you're not getting enough leads in your company. 
Are you a tight niche or a generalist? Um, I would consider myself something in between. We do massive Victorian mansion restorations. We do powder rooms. We do cabinets. We do trim decks, all this other stuff. People may think of me as a generalist, but really what we do is not that different. We, we've actually gotten rid of wallpaper, decorative finishes, glazing cabinets, all those other sort of things. So you're going to change your pricing based on that. If you only have a very small amount of things that you can pick from, you might have to modify your prices so you can get more of that. When we're a generalist company, you may not have to. You can be a little more wide ranging because you do a lot of other things. Also, seasonal demand. Data point for you guys, I spend almost my entire marketing budget in the six months over winter because winter, theoretically, people just don't demand painting services inside their house as much as they do in the summer. In the summer, we have the option of going inside and outside of Minnesota. In the winter, it's only inside and people normally like to hole up. So we have to force the demand. We have to create our own higher demand in the winter for that sort of thing. And the fun stuff, the data, the analytics. So again, here's a sales tracker. You can derive a lot of great things from following your estimates. Writing down every estimate you did, whether it sold or you lost it, what the price of that estimate was, and just following those numbers. If you can add in where it came from, you know, did they find you on Google? Did they find you on Facebook? Was it a flyer? Things like that. You can actually start deriving some pretty cool things. My internal marketing budget is 3.5% of revenue. So for a million dollar paint company, that means you would spend about $35,000 a year in marketing to generate all the leads you need outside of word of mouth referral. You can actually get down to then cost per lead. In my company, generally, it costs about $125 worth of marketing to get one person to ask me for painting. Now that's just an estimate. And then if our SR is 50%, you can see that this is a very interesting number, but you can start getting these numbers and then you can start tracking, well, what's the cost per lead on Google? What's the cost per lead on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, flyers, newspaper, etc. Still have questions? <laughs> You're never gonna feel 100% comfortable with pricing and estimating, but you can have data that says, well, listen, I don't know if this is perfect, but we have enough work for our company. The work we are doing is profitable, and I feel comfortable with our estimating process. You can always improve that, but those are the kind of baselines of it all. So another thing to consider is uh, price is kind of set by you, but really you have to understand price is set by thousands of irrational consumers out there. And irrational is not a negative term. Irrational is they a person may think that a painting a powder room is a $4,000 job that takes two weeks because they don't know. Also, somebody may think a powder room costs $22 to paint because that's what a gallon of paint is at Menards to paint. They may also have had a cousin who's out of work come over and paint it for $75 because they needed cash. That may be their baseline. So when you come in and say, we charge $375 to paint a powder room, they may gasp. They say, oh my God, my, my, uh, my semi-alcoholic uh, neighbor who is out of work only charged me 75. Well, guess what? That's an irrational consumer. Their baseline isn't, isn't set properly like that. So you have to understand that not good, not bad, but just don't react violently and, and with all these feeling towards client because they don't know what this is. They don't know to charge. Another thing is <laughs> it may not be price. Or if you really want to increase your price, you may have to actually add more value. Uh, the three biggest value adders that we do as a company is helping with color, moving furniture, and cleaning up after ourselves. Those three things. And we address those directly in our estimates to make sure that people know that that's what they're getting. It might be easier to justify your price, not by the quality of paint you use, but by the service and the level of service you give around it. So always consider those kind of intangibles. If you're a solopreneur and you're not taking home $80,000 plus a year, you need to change one of these. You need to either get better or faster at your job, or you need to raise your rates or both. That's a data point that I can guarantee you is true with those things there. All right, let's get back into here and let's start running through some questions. Man, I can't thank you guys enough for, uh, for all the, holy cow, there's people from all over saying hi. Bon dia, all my friends down in Brazil. Okay, Ron Gerhardt, what's your method for pricing residential new construction? Two thoughts. This is more theory based, which is we have production rates on this and all that other stuff. But I will tell you this new construction, residential new construction is a very painful way to go through this industry painting. The rates are cut rate. You're actually a subcontractor. So somebody's charging your rate and then they find you and give you a much smaller rate. So if you think you're going to get your flagship residential private client stuff, um, you know, um, uh, rates on that. You will not unless you find a special builder. So what I say is, what is the opportunity cost? Um, 
the last, I think last year was the first year in the history of this company. We did not do a residential new house because we did not look for them because the year previous we did three and it was very painful. Um, the opportunity cost is what could have you done with that time or money that would be better. In the time that we did those three new construction houses, that was super painful. We were ordered to be on site with this many people on these days. It didn't work into the schedule. It's always last minute. They're asking us to do stuff for free all the time. Uh, it wasn't a good fit for our company because we didn't dictate the quality of the process or the timeline. And, and certainly it felt like the client's best wishes were not looked after during the whole process. And, and we wept for the client because it's not a good process for them. Um, so what we said was in the time that we did those three new houses, we could have probably painted for 38 private clients and that's a better use of our time. So Ron, when you're talking about pricing residential new construction, I will say if, if one new construction house is equal to about 12 private client jobs, it must be at least as much money and as profitable as those 12 private client jobs for me to even consider knowing that there's going to be super pain in that sort of thing. So John Busick, my good friend, uh, I probably screw up at least weekly on pricing and learn from it each time. No better way to learn. That's exactly it, man. Getting the data. Uh, Dylan Gurelli, good morning. David Evans, how are you, my friend? Uh, Mr. Steininger, thank you for the poster, my friend. Uh, one of my most cherished items. All right. Good morning, Mr. Joseph. Plus Alan Rusecki, but doesn't prices all based on location. Oh, you people, this thing, I get so frustrated with this. I get frustrated to no end. People say, yeah, Nick, all this is fine, but you're not in San Francisco. You're not in Omaha. You're not this. Stop it. When I did my pricing show and as a stunt, people posted their prices and I just gave them a price. What do you charge for X? Hey, give it to me. I did it. The prices were so equivalent across the board. The prices were so equivalent across the board that there was only about a 10 to 20% variation based on the most expensive area codes and the least expensive area codes. People use location as an excuse. Stop it. Stop it. Painters aren't that good that their prices are so dialed in that location would even make a difference. I will tell you this. Most people don't know how to price their work. They're pricing it incorrectly and they're not charging enough. So I would say location be damned. That's that's a very complex version of what do you charge for X? I would say most, most painters aren't complex enough in their day-to-day -day operations to use that as a variable because they have all this other stuff like they're, they're having failures in their paint process. So don't worry about the slight variations between San Francisco and San Bernardino in prices, if there even is any. I would say your production needs to get better. You need to start upping your prices anyway, regardless of where you live, give or take. So, but that is a point of frustration for me because people like to use that as an excuse not to discuss pricing. I will say BS, BS. Dave Pine, good morning. Any thoughts on using estimating services? We get approached by numerous companies several times a year. Curious if any has experience. Yes. So uh, if you guys have noticed, your email inboxes have probably been flooded with, hey, uh, we're, we're an estimating firm and we do all this. Do not think that they are going to do your job for you. I have used them before. Uh, namely, I, I use a lot of these companies, some of them in India, for takeoffs on, on uh, <coughs> larger new construction and commercial jobs. And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll actually estimate the project for you. Uh, I just, I'm just looking for wall square footage, ceiling square footage, linear foots of things like that. And they come back and they'll actually put in rates for that stuff. They are so wildly incorrect. Do not ever think somebody's going to estimate this stuff for you. I know that's that's, that's just a thought experiment, Dave. But those uh, I've used about seven or eight different firms for that stuff, and they have volunteered to give pricing on those things. Well, and I don't know what it's based on, but it is not based on reality or humans or painting or this industry. It is so wildly off; it's almost comical. So, all right, Jim Callahan, how's it going, man? I love that. Jim is a friend and a client and uh, a past apprentice. Love that guy. Aaron, good morning. Aaron Muncy. Du, 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 du. Carlos, how's it going, man? Wendy Anderson. Oh, one of my favorite clients, Wendy Anderson. I appreciate how much you went through pricing with me on the stairwell your cruise did for me. You were direct and complete in each step in price. I also love that my approval was important and you clearly let me know if the price might rise because of unexpected issues. I will hire your company in a heartbeat for my next project. So professional. 
Again, we can we can stand there in Wendy's beautiful Victorian house in uh, in St. Paul because and give her and address her needs because we don't have to sit there and measure. We don't have to do all this other stuff. It's Wendy has some things that she wants to talk about her beautiful house, color, processes, timeline, things like that. And I would much rather use our data set as a weapon to come up with a very quick estimate so that Wendy and I can just talk, especially when I'm in an old house and we can talk about the history of the house. I'm very interested in that as well too. So I don't want to waste my time uh, doing that stuff. So, all right, Nick Rice, I sent you an email about the SOP video. I will absolutely send you my SOPs. I should also say this, I would be happy to send you an estimate template um, if you email me, nick at nickslavic.com, but do not think for a second that this is going to tell you what to charge. You need to figure that out. I can send you my G sheet uh, sample that you can put your prices in, but there's no calculations on this. This is just a format of what I show my clients. I'm happy to do that. Uh, Mark Adams, Holly Barlow, I need that children's book. <laughs> Holly. So for people who do, this is some things I save for people in person or my closest people in the industry. And if you come to my estimating master's class, I show you my children's book of estimating. And I, I, I name that because it's kind of hilarious, right? All right, we're gonna get to TikTok and Instagram here shortly. Kyle Dare, uh, I shouldn't be here saying this, but that's mm, naughty word. That's how painters get their prices controlled. It happens in the automotive business for painting cars. And guess what? It causes lots of problems trying to tell someone there's a time frame. Ooh, lots of naughty words in that one, my friend. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, I'm trying to figure out what the through line is. When it comes to customer and owner relations, then down and down, everyone will have problems. No way to guess like that on repaints. Yeah, Kyle, um, appreciate it. Sounds like you're kind of angry, dude. Uh, let me know what I can help you with. If you, I, I can't actually tell if you agree or disagree with any of this stuff. Uh, John Busick, a couple comments on production rates. All right, here it comes. Holly Barlow, Stephen Colvin. Good morning, Nick. Sash right. Oh my God, love following you guys. A uh, couple comments on production rate. It takes a lot of experience and data to come up with accurate rates. Repaints require sniff tests based on prep, location, access, client schedule, et cetera. New construction re requires X factors beyond the rates and should be calculated when in doubt and some fluff. That said, we need to know our numbers, yes, before adding uh, the fluff factor because the base prices should keep your job from putting you out of business. Sometimes the most profitable jobs are the jobs you don't get. <laughs> I love that. John, for those of you who don't know John, uh, deep wisdom, um, one of the, uh, one of the uh, stalwarts in the industry, uh, one of the bright minds, one of the guys who influenced me very early on. So that is rooted in deep, deep wisdom right there. I would always listen to John Busick. <laughs> Aaron, how does one make time for all this when working in the field still? So Aaron, I will say this unsatisfying uh, bit of talk here, which is if you want to run a business, it is hard and is going to take time. So when I ran a solopreneur version of my business, from four to six in the morning, uh, I would do this. From six to four, 10 hours during the day, I would paint. From four to eight, I would do my estimating at night. How fast, how good do you want to run a business? If you say, that's not fair, I only want to work seven and a half hours a day, well, good. You're only going to get the equivalent return from that business if you do that. Um, the requirements for owning a business are having a proven process and job costing. Those are minimal entry fees. If you're not doing those, you're not doing the minimum requirements it takes to run a successful business. Yes, you can cowboy through this. You cannot job cost. You cannot have any data. You cannot do any of the things that a business has. I have, but it's not a way to sustain a business. All that could blow away in a heartbeat. And you're not gonna, you're gonna go through wild swings of feelings that could actually cause you physical harm. Uh, if you are not, if you are, if your mind and body and mindset are not robust enough to deal with the wild feeling swings that come with running a business, you could actually have physical harm done to your body in the form of stress-induced injuries, things like that, strokes, heart attacks. Um, your will, your will can be diminished to the point where you don't want to wake up in the morning and do this sort of thing. So what I'm telling you is that job costing isn't something that only the fancy pants, John Busick and all these other guys who have been doing this forever do this. It is the minimum requirement of running a successful business. If you ever want to have less problems and more money, that is the minimum to do. This is not something extra, something that only fancy people do. 
Brandon Zimmer. Oh, yes. Also, Aaron Munoz. Um, the best way I, I sort of think about running a business is every 24-hour day has three eight-hour days in it. Most people work for eight, sleep for eight, and then piss away eight. Um, if you're a business owner, I would urge you to use the third eight. I've been very conscious about using my third eight split between work and family. What you don't hear in there is video games, TV, and a whole bunch of other personal things. But the good thing for me, I love this business. I love this craft and I love my family. So those things take the place of any time I would have pissed away on video games, TV, all that other stuff. Brandon Zimmerman. It may seem overwhelming for somebody to say, okay, what kind of systems do we need to put in place for capturing this data? We use Vericlock, the clock in and clock out in each individual, individual job. Very simple. It gives us laser accuracy and getting the data on how long each project takes us. I can look back three to six months and whatever. Yeah, that's great. It's just doing it. It's not impossible. This stuff already exists. You just need to gather it, give or take. And again, how good do you want to be? If, if you are stressed out, if every day is problems, putting out fires one after another, and you don't take the next steps, put forth the effort to solve any of those things. In effect, what you're saying is, I don't mind this state of chaos, or this state of chaos is much better in my mind than actually putting forth effort to solve it. I would much rather stay here and have this chaos than put forth a little effort and solve it. That's what you're saying by not taking action. Astrid Diaz, good morning. How's it going? Stephen Colvin, we are booked out a year and I'm adding capacity to bring our lead time down to six months max. We're billed at $100 an hour and I'm considering raising our rates. How would you calculate the new billable rate? Uh, so Stephen, I don't care about billable rates. You can bill whatever the hell you want. What do you produce? So Stephen, I would I would urge you, I'd be happy to work with you offline if you email me, nick at nickslavic.com. Uh, if you haven't job costed yet, let's job cost. If you have job costed, let's look at what you're actually producing because People get all sorts of craziness about, hey, I sold this at, at this billable rate. And I'll say, that is all make-believe, fake, whatever numbers, right? They're good for some things, but the real number is what did you produce? That's the final arbiter of all this stuff. I don't care what you charge. I don't care what you sell. What did you produce? So honestly, what I would do now is figure out if you're if you're booked out that far, it's likely you're underpricing your work, may or may not be. There's just a generalization based on what uh, what statistically I've seen out there. But um, yeah, if you're billing out $100 an hour and not producing $100 an hour, then you need to start looking into uh, changing the way you price your work. Most people who say they bill $75 to $100 an hour do not produce $75 or $100 an hour. Uh, that is the truth. All right, Michael Court Hampton, thank you much. Jeremy Courtney, where is the PDCA, now the PCA convention this year? March in Orlando. There's a link in the show notes for this thing here. Uh, Travis Contreras, feeding the machine. Kevin Rogers, hey, Nick, what's your method for pricing skim coating walls? Again, you go to the data set. We do not have a robust data set on skimming walls. And the one we do deals with new stuff and then with historic restoration. We only maybe have 10 to 20 data points for each of those things over the years in those things. So we have a smaller, more variable data set. But... The best thing you can do is just theorize how long is it going to take you to skim coat a room, use your charge rate, use your production rate, or that benchmark 55 an hour and start reasoning into a price like that. But honestly, our data set is much smaller than cabinets, you know, things like that. So we have a price for that. We have a price for square foot, but it's not as robust and not as deep as the other one. So Nick, thanks for all you do. You're such a professional. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Travis, sorry, I meant to finish the question with, if you were a two to five man company and you were the owner... Uh, where would your single room cost be? I know you're in the 400. Yes. So I have, uh, uh, okay. If you were a two to five man company, yeah. Um, where the, uh, and you were the owner. So if I did not paint, I would probably oscillate that between four to $500, um, per room. Now, what you can do, you can charge a hell of a lot more if you go out there and also market a whole bunch more and get more leads, things like that. But theoretically, here's how I think about it, Travis. Smaller the company, higher the rates. Larger the company, lower the rates because you got a machine. Now you can make up for that with marketing, which is what we do. You know, we don't wait for organic stuff to come in. We send out flyers and stuff like that. Uh, da, 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 Valentino, Miranda, good morning, Nick. How do you compete with companies that use subs? Uh, if we use employees and carry workers comp plus payroll. So it's not just price all the time, Valentino. We use subs and W-2s and each of them have pluses and minuses. 
Um, there's a whole bunch of different value propositions in there. Uh, just because people use subs doesn't mean they're less expensive. Um, I know a lot of companies that use subs and are more expensive, but it's all the value proposition. What are you getting uh, for that? All right, Aaron Muncy, spreadsheets are king. Data rules all. Absolutely. Ron Gerhardt's. Do you use an estimating platform like Estimate Rocket? So I have looked into all those things. I love them, actually. Um, I love Estimate Rocket. The problem is our company is expanding at such a rate that I've based everything in Google for now uh, so that it can be infinitely messed with by me. And I understand the system. It's a lot of manual effort on me and Estimator Andy's part to keep this thing running and all consistent. But it's a thing that we can change daily, weekly, monthly. And since we created the system, we can comply with it a lot better. So for now, we are not using an estimating app or software or anything else. We are using the uh, our own stuff only because we need it to be infinitely customizable at the moment because we're going through crazy stages of complexity and professionalization in this business here. So do, 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 do. All right. Michael Hornsby. How's it going, man? Uh, Darren, uh, Will Torres, Nick, <laughs> give our good old buddies, uh, Case and Jose from Sherwin-Williams a shout out. Love you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, and I will personally say not just Sherwin-Williams, but uh, leave your dang paint reps alone, people. Yes, price increases are coming. Who cares? You can't control it. You can sort of. If you have a super big business and you have negotiating and buying power, you can actually negotiate some of that stuff. So the biggest way, if everybody's out there complaining about their Sherwin and Benjamin Moore reps and all the other reps right now, these people are your allies. Partner with them. They are assets to your company. My reps are huge assets to my company. They, they contact me weekly saying, how can we help your business grow? And they are active participants in this because I don't beat them up about price. The price of materials is not what's keeping me from profitability. Case Jose, you're doing the Lord's work out there. Take care of your painters. They want to grow businesses aggressively and partner with them. And painters, be nice to Case and Jose. They're your friends. They're going to help you. Get out there and do this. Uh, Michael Hornby, anybody using National Paint Cost Estimator? Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, also a really cool thing. I actually have the PCA estimating guides here too. So super sneaky hidden resource in the industry. If you want to dig into this and you have no experience painting or you do, but you don't have any started production rates or anything else, you can actually go to the PCA, their website, buy price and estimating guides, and that'll be a good start for you. And then you can modify them over the years. That's a really cool thing. Jeremy Courtney. Hey, Nick, explain to my wife who is here listening with me why I should attend the PCA convention for the first time this year. Jeremy, I am not a company man for the PCA. I will give you interesting data point. I got involved with the PCA five or six years ago. I attended my first big convention. I met people like John Busick, um, you know, the Dave Scoturos, the, uh, the Gina Quartz of the industry, the people who run these monster multi-generational companies that have deep wisdom. Uh, they pulled me aside and told me everything that I was doing right and wrong and that I needed to do in the future. They were open. They were honest. They called me on my BS and I saw the biggest jump in, um, uh, in personal growth, professional growth, and professionalization of my company since then. Five or six years ago, you could look at a graph of my history of the 29 years I've been here, and I did great all those other years. I did real great since then. The hockey stick curve kicked up since then because I got wise after that. I got perspective. Business success is grit and information. I had plenty of grit to do this stuff. I did not have the information. The people at the PCA Expo have the information. And if you have the grit and you throw that information on there, you're going to be supercharged like I was. My life legitimately is changed today because of the people I met there. The expo itself will not do that. Paying your membership dues will not do that. It's the people. Pay your membership dues, go to the expo, and then dig in with the people and your life will change. I'm not going to, under, I'm not going to oversell it, but my life has changed since then. The people, are, the people I met there are lifelong friends now. And they're some of the most robust, aggressive, progressive people I've ever met in my life. Awesome people. All right, Harvey, you're right. Stress almost killed me. Been in business for 30 years and finally doing it a different way. Love to hear that, man. Same with me. Michael Hornsby, will you get you will get unbelievable growth from presenters and associated. Yep, absolutely. At the expo. Please explain your arithmetic for the four-wall bedroom calculation uh, when you as an owner painted it. Adam Voise. All right. Oh, super simple here. Let's go back. So guys, simple math. We learned this stuff in elementary school, right? 
This is a bedroom I charged $425. I had $60 in material, basically a gallon and a paint and sundries or two gallons of paint. That's 14% of this price right there. Our goal is 15%. It took me three hours. I pay myself $30 an hour as the owner of this company. And there's a 25% burden on labor. So if you pay somebody $10 an hour, it actually costs you $12.50 an hour to do that. So in effect, I had $112.50 of labor of this project, which is 26.4% of this. If you take revenue divided by the number of hours worked, you're going to get this number right here. I produced $121.60 every single hour that I painted that particular project. Um, do, 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 do. Let me make sure, uh, sorry, the there's so many dang comments it skipped here. <laughs> Sumter, uh, wait a second here. You'll get unbelievable growth presenters. You get, uh, da, 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 da. Sumter, can you expound on how marketing helps you balance the rate depending on the size of the company? Yeah, if you have more jobs coming in and the more abilities to estimate jobs, you can charge more. If you only have a few jobs coming in uh, through word of mouth or whatever else, you you got to get those things. So te theoretically, by economic principles, your price has to be a little lower. Uh, let's see. Uh, Adam Voise, I hope that helps. Uh, if you have a specific question about the bedroom pricing thing, let me know. I know people fixate on that a lot of the times. Uh, Steve Lockwood, Nick is slowly changing myself and my business. Awesome, man. That means a lot to me. Build a relationship with your vendor. Michael Court Hampton, the PCA estimating guide gives great foundation. I would absolutely agree. PCA residential forum exploded my business. Absolutely. I will agree. Uh, will Torres, I, I've seen personal growth in just six months after <laughs> these uh, one hours with my man, Nick. Thank you so much, man. That means so much to me. You have no idea. Strong answers. Kyle Jeffrey, Nick, love what you're doing. Question for you. We are doing roughly 10 to 20 estimates a week with one estimator plus myself. It gets crazy. Staying organized with callback questions, customer signings, schedule estimates, et cetera, has proven to be hectic. And I always worry we forget something. Any advice or tools? Yes. Um, estimator Andy does 18 on his own a week. I usually do five to 10. Uh, with our next estimator coming on, we'll be doing another 18 a week, give or take. So we'll have the capacity to do at least 40 a week, uh, give or take. Uh, you must have an SOP. Uh, so in my company, we actually have a SOP for estimating, which is I am going to attempt to screen share. Now you have to bear with me. So hold on one second. I will share this with you. I'm going to a Google tab. Here we go. So write the process down. Again, you guys have watched my, um, my estimating show. We're going to hide this one. Or you have watched my standard operating procedure show. Guess what? I have a standard operating procedure for this as well. So as you can see, I'm going to make sure this shows up here. Yep. This is the exact process that we follow for this. Again, here's the three keys to a perfect estimate. Be brief and be bright. Give them only the information they want and be prompt. Number one, this starts at the lead. We assess the lead. We make initial contact. We reply with a stock email and schedule the estimate. We create a Google Calendar event. The estimate, the prep. Before we leave each morning for our estimates, we confirm the estimate date and time with the client. We get a confirmation. We create a Google folder for the project. We create an estimate template. So we take one of our Google templates, make a copy, put all the client's information. It's sitting in their Google folder ready so that when we actually do the estimate, we just upload their images, fill out the information for that job, print it out, and move on. Estimate, 10 minutes early to the site. Here's the actual presentation. You greet the client, you verify the scope with the client. You actually wanna figure out what they use. Listen and ask clarifying questions, take detailed notes, create the estimate in your vehicle. You email the entire packet and you print it off on site and then you present it to the client. Uh, after that, based on the client's wishes, we either you know, sell the job or don't, or they need time. You update our CRM. So then we, uh, we get into Trello and we move a card around. Uh, we make sure the Google Drive has everything in it where it needs to be. And then that sales tracker, which I shared with you guys, we input the client's name, the price, and then we start tracking all that stuff. But it's done every single estimate. This is the key. This is the absolute key, which I'm going to tell you. Um, you must do this every estimate. If you do 10 to 20 estimates a week and then do all the stuff at the end of the week, you will forget something. It is not okay to do that. So you must do it while you're at that estimate. Um, and then we start our follow-up process, uh, 24 to 48 hours, give or take. We have a series of follow-ups. We update the CRM based on the follow-ups. When we sell a job, 
we hand it off to our production team and we brief them uh, and then client care before, during, and after. So if the client has questions, uh, we answer them. Now, there is also some admin stuff. So weekly sales meeting, uh, the CRM has to be updated. Uh, the Google Drive has to be organized with all the estimates, all follow-ups complete, and the sales tracker updated with weekly numbers. So for us, <coughs> let me go back up here. Sorry, you guys are commenting so much. I'm, I'm, I'm getting comments skipped here. So yeah, Kyle Jeffrey, drill this. Just like how I paint a bedroom, 22 steps to paint a bedroom. I do the exact same thing for the estimate. It's the same process every time. Same morning, same ritual, same everything. Kyle, uh, if you email me, nick at nickslavic.com, I can send you this SOP and you can build off it and do that stuff too. Um, Austin Schumacher, you've changed my uh, the backend management of my company. Oops, sorry, I'm kicking my own camera around. You've changed the backend management of my business with all the data tracking. Oh, thanks a lot, man. I really appreciated that. Sumter, awesome. Chris Brook, hey, you struck a nerve regarding paint reps. As a small single man LLC who doesn't purchase the volume compared to large painting companies using Benjamin Moore, price increases accompanied with no product availability has me considering the large box stores. Am I wrong? Yes. Who cares? Chris? Materials are easy to fixate on and be made the devil because there's a price, we have to get them. Now there's friction with supply chain. Everybody has supply chain issues. Everybody's raising their rates. You will not find a paint company out there who has all the paint and who hasn't increased their prices this year. So I would, I would tell you right now, just buy the best stuff and get your labor up instead. Um, I did the calculation for all these price increases you hear about, 14%, 8%, 5%, give or take. Here's the calculation you guys need to know. And sorry, I'm going to get rid of this thing. I want to be really serious when I say this. If you make another $1.12 an hour this year, you will make up and then some for every single price increase over the next year. If you make another $1.10 an hour, $1.12 an hour this year, every hour you work, you will make up for and then some every single material price increase out there. Do not fixate on materials. It is not worth it. Fixate on your labor. Most people are vastly underperforming and underselling their work. The low hanging fruit is not materials. It is you being better, you getting a higher price with more value for your clients and going out there and executing consistently on that. That's the biggest thing. It is not paint. So Chris, I'm sorry. I get a little spicy. You are absolutely wrong. Stop worrying about materials. Get the best. Get, do whatever you can to get enough of it and move on. I don't have any other... I actually have more problems with supply chain stuff than smaller companies because of the quantity that we need uh, and the availability of stuff. So don't think that I have it any easier. Now, yes, we have very special buying power and we probably get some preferential treatment, but it's not just because the amount of paint we purchase. A lot of it is because I love my paint reps and we are partners in this. I never beat them up about anything. I never make wild ass without delivering and we have a good relationship. It's just like personal relationships. It's just like relationships with your client. If you have a punitive relationship, it's not going to be as good. So, all right, Nick, how do you handle your accounting and bookkeeping? So uh, I have two accounting degrees uh, from college, a uh, double minor in it, and I know enough to hire a bookkeeper. And when I went out and found a bookkeeper, I found somebody who would also be a kind of ad hoc board of advisor person. I have a local accountant who share my same core values and they actually advise me on a lot of business things. So I am deep into the finances of my company, but the day-to-day -day bookkeeping, I do not do. Um, I get reports from my bookkeeper and I analyze them and I do my own reports and analytics as I need them. But the day-to-day, -day, the nuts and bolts entering in the 300 transactions a month we have, leave that to somebody else, pay somebody else to do that. And definitely don't do your own payroll and taxes. That is one of the most foolish things you could ever do. Um, Adam Voise, thanks, Nick. I was confused by you charging only $30 an hour. Adam, that is what I pay myself as the labor rate. What I charge is $425. I do not charge by the hour. I charge $425 for that bedroom, and it's my problem to get that done very quickly. I have to pay myself something in order to job cost. I pay myself $30 an hour. Thomas Drake, there we go. Clarification. Nick, what CRM do you use? A Google Sheet, unsatisfying answer. I make my own and we work from there. Uh, Rail, Correa, just got here, but how do you manage a three hour job on eight hour work day? Your guy is probably going to spend more time than three hours. Maybe uh, if you have enough marketing, enough estimating, if that is only a single, um, a single room project, line them up with two more that day. 
as a sales team, I need to provide full-time work for all my people. And we go out there and we market to increase. So if the problem is, you, yes, you're, you're always going to be having like shorter days just because of wild things like that. But if you have a full pipeline full of leads and estimates and work, you can just start scheduling one after another. Tell them to go to another job. Easy enough. Uh, Will Torres, will you be attending P P D? Okay, folks, here, real quick. PCA, Painting Contractors Association. It used to be called PDCA. This event is not called PCA or PDCA. It is the Expo. The PCA is the organization. It's like saying the Buffalo Bills and the Super Bowl. That's the equivalent. The PCA is the Buffalo Bills. The Expo is the Super Bowl, give or take. I will be there with my entire team. I will be doing two presentations. So buckle up. They are going to be absolutely fun, give or take. Um, Jamie Burkhardt, do you use Trello as your CRM? We tried and it failed miserably. So we do not. Uh, we use Trello as a visual management from taking jobs from lead all the way to completed on different boards. My sales team has a board. My production team has a board. I actually have a board for Ask a Painter to track my projects and content creation in there as well, too. Looking forward to seeing you at the retreat, Jamie, by the way. It's going to be awesome. Real Korea. Plus, do you have a percentage number you add on top of the cost of every job to cover the expenses to run the business, like insurance? That is the cost of my jobs. Now, you can estimate in any number of ways. And I'm so sorry, TikTok, Instagram, we'll get to you guys, but uh, the Facebook questions are coming in hot and heavy here. You can estimate on any number of ways. There are people out there who take a can of paint and add all sorts of crazy calculations to it to come up with a price for a job. It doesn't matter how you charge for it. It's that you charge a price where you can pay for that stuff. That's all that matters. I hope that helps, but I don't do that method. <laughs> Eric, fast that louder for the people in back. I think you're probably talking about my material stuff. Like, listen, guys, I don't get spicy on the internet much, but I see people riddled with limiting beliefs. Yeah, but there's supply chain interruptions. Yeah, but there's a 14% price increase. Yeah, but there's no good people out here. It's all limiting beliefs. And people use that as an excuse for not executing. I will tell you this. Shut the TV off, shut the painter Facebook, internet's off, things like that. Don't listen to other people. Get out there and take care of your clients. I guarantee you, you will have the best year of your life if you have sweat running down your face and you have happy clients. Magically, you will be profitable. <laughs> Matthew Kern, I love how passionate you are. <laughs> yeah, Dude, this gives me great energy. I love this. And I was there. This isn't me knowing all the answers. I've I've toiled for 29 years to get to where we are now. I have learned, if you think you've learned a lesson that I haven't, you're probably wrong. I've probably have a hundred different iterations of pain and friction and suffering and problem in this. And I've dealt with them in all different ways to get data points and then give them to you guys. So uh, Russell Peach, Nick, you need drip jobs. Drip jobs is awesome. Uh, I've been talking with Tanner Mullen about it too. Um, uh, and we're in some, uh, 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 yeah, we're, we've been talking to Tanner Mullen about that stuff. The problem is, um, you guys will see a through line through this, which is in order to give good data for my company and give good data to you, I have to bootstrap a lot of things my own. I would rather go through an enormous amount of effort on my own to create my own systems and processes and apps and software and CRMs and things like that because I know the inner workings of it. So when it comes time to pick an estimate rocket, a drip job, uh, another CRM, um, uh, you know, work glue, things like that, I will have known what I need out of it. So we're just not there at that time because our business is going through crazy growth like this. I just want to keep it with stuff that we can control here. So Kyle Jeffley, accounting grads. High five. Uh, will Torres, material makes you money. Without it, you won't paint. Okay. It, it's it, You can't control it. So I will say, don't worry about it. I agree. We're probably saying the same thing, but don't worry about it. Stop it. You're not going to do it. The value of a rep is more than just giving you a break on the cost of paint. My rep helped me understand the value of SEO. Yes. And marking up my materials to have a successful business. Yes. Can't wait to see Andy. Yes. Andy will be there as well too. All right. Sorry. Let's go through and see what we got here. Uh, oh man. Love everybody watching here. Thank you. Especially on TikTok. We just started broadcasting to TikTok too. Uh, Michael Crane. Thanks so much. He likes the job costing show. Do, 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 do. <laughs> hey, Nick, nice to finally see your face. I've been listening to you on the podcast apps. Well, what's interesting is that uh, this show gets turned into an audio only version. For five and a half years, my ugly mug has been on the internet uh, broadcasting like this. So really the, the, the audio only version is a newer version and uh, a more rare version of this thing. Uh, hello from Cleveland. How many second graders uh, could you fight before getting overwhelmed? Oh, that's interesting. So what I know of second graders, because we've had some and we do have some, um, 
it depends how aggressive they are and it depends if they all come at you at once. But I feel like I could deal with at least one classroom worth of them if they all came at me at once, just because of brute strength. And I don't have much of that, but I feel like I could handle that. Good question. I like that. Um, what kind of painting? House painting. Mm, love this. Uh, getting lots of fun stuff on TikTok here. So All right. Two years in learning every day. That's awesome. Uh, I've watched hours and hours of your YouTube videos. That's another place to find me as well, too. So, all right, let's see what we got here. Do, 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 do. Let's see what we got. Oh, man, lots of people watching on Instagram as well, too. Thank you guys for this. If you guys want to actually see my screen shares, you got to go to Facebook. Um, that's where I, I, uh, I can do the screen share in the app, and you can actually see all these things I'm talking about, pictures, images, spreadsheets, things like that. All right, Nick told my students to tune in some of your podcasts out here in Omaha. That's awesome. So thank you for that. Uh, if you ever want to do some live collaboration or live stream together, I'm happy to do that for the benefit of your uh, students. I would, I would like that a great deal. So, all right, let's go through the last bit of uh, questions here, and then I'm taking the kids ice fishing here. So uh, Dan's a pansic. Funny. I'm bringing in a class of second graders to the expo, so we should... <laughs> <laughs> Those Pansics are some of the funniest people on earth, man. Stephen Colvin. Uh, yeah, you're going to be huge on TikTok. Yeah, I don't care. We'll get there. Uh, my uh, Eventually, my clients will be of the age to be on TikTok as these things go, uh, and we'll, we'll use it then. Uh, Mike Miller, you want a good challenge on second graders? We invite you to come mod the paint contractors group. Uh, wish I could. I don't have the bandwidth for that sort of stuff. I'd be happy to jump in where you guys need me. If you tag me on posts, I can certainly get spicy where I need to, but uh, otherwise, thanks much. Uh, all right. Buenos dias, Francisco. Uh, love that as well, too. Thank you, everybody. I do appreciate this. Uh, I also want to thank the painting contractors group and all their moderators because they've been uh, creating some pretty awesome memes of me, uh, which is great, and, and sharing them around and uh, ultra flattering ultra flattering uh, about that sort of thing. So, okay. Oh, Eric Fastnet. Sorry. One more question. Nick, I'd love to hear you talk more about your recent post about leadership coaching uh, you're doing with your team, how it's presented to them, what's your team excited about, what's the goal? Goal is to increase, uh, um, increase people's knowledge and exposure to accountability. We started in 2022 a biweekly leadership coaching and mentoring group for every single person in my company. It's voluntary. They're on the clock. Many of them already worked their 40 hours. So this is all time and a half. We work a four day work week. This is on a Friday morning. Every other Friday morning, we meet at our local from scratch cafe. Uh, we all share a meal. Company pays for the meal. Company puts everybody on the clock. I bought them all books. We read the books together. We share takeaways. We each list a personal, professional, and superordinate goal. And then we update those goals each week as people want. And then we make asks of the group. Um, if somebody's not hitting their goals or doesn't know how to hit their goal, they make an ask of the group, a formal ask saying, hey, listen, uh, one of the biggest topics nowadays is personal budgeting. Hey, I want to start a personal budget. How do we do that? And then we use this group uh, to do that. I am slowly introducing everybody to heightened levels of accountability because being able to be told you're not good at this and you need to get better People who aren't open to accountability will bristle against that and fight you, and eventually it makes them sad and they leave. A good person, a good leader, uh, a good master craftsperson, a good business owner will take that and say, okay, tell me more about that. Tell me how I'm not doing good. What can I do to improve? And then take in that data and actually make changes on that. But they don't have an emotional response to it. And that's what I'm introducing everybody in my company to, which is that heightened levels of accountability. Uh, especially, you know, when a client pulls you aside and says, I don't like this job. I don't trust you guys anymore. This is not great. You could fire back a big F you, or you could say, Hey, listen, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. Let's sit down and let's talk about this because we want a resolution for you. And those are two very different ways of solving the problem. One of them is very successful and one is not. So, all right, Eric, thank you so much. All right, people, I am out of here for today. I do appreciate this.